I'm really excited to be talking about how history or how comics frame history today um, because uh, it's a passion of mine personally and I'm doubly excited to have so many amazing guests um, that I'm going to have them introduce themselves. Um, and so take it away, Gary. Oh, um, my name is Gary Groth. Um, I am the uh, co-founder of Fanographics Books and the Comics Journal. Um, I am, uh, gee, I'm just an old white guy. <laughs> I bear um, an uncanny resemblance to Cary Grant, so if you just keep that in, in mind, you don't even have to look at me. And um, as I was saying earlier uh, with, in our sound check, I'm not, um, I don't think I'm an expert on historical comics per se, I'm, I'm more of a generalist, but I've been, um, I did co-found uh, the Comics Journal in 1976, and I've been um, editing or co-editing it um, from that time. So I'm, I've been thoroughly immersed um, in comics from then and in the history of comics, and happy to talk about uh, the role history has played in comics. Hi everyone, my name is Tamiko Nimura. I'm a creative nonfiction writer and public historian from Tacoma. Uh, I contribute regularly to History Link and I'm the co-author of the graphic novel We Hereby Refuse, Japanese American Resistance to Wartime Incarceration. It's published by Seattle's Chin Music Press and the Wing Luke Museum. You can actually see my words at the wing right now there's an exhibit inspired by the graphic novel, and it's up through October 2023. And I'm also working on an intergenerational family memoir. I am a brown-skinned Asian American woman with a gray jean jacket and long, wavy hair. I'm Christy Valenti. I am a white lady with pinkish purple hair, a teal top, and a teal plaid skirt. Um, let's see, I haven't done any public speaking in three years, so please grant me grace. Um, I'm an editor at Fanographics Books and the Comics Journal, so that's my employer, pointing to Gary Groth. And I've been there for about 20 years. Um, I work with critical prose writing about comics and their history. I also edit comics, historical, graphic, nonfiction, usually translated. And I, I do want to point out that um, while Tomiko's book is sold out in most places, there is a QR code here where you can uh, order from the back order. Um, but I, it's, it's been sold out pretty much everywhere, so good luck. <laughs> there are e-copies available, though, through Chin Music Press. Oh, great, yes. <clears throat> and I know it's sold out because I tried to order a copy recently. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> awesome. So I, I wanted to start with a discussion of what comics are and you know a lot of people you know have an idea of what they think comics are um, and that's part of it certainly but um, I think a lot of people are, don't know the long history of comics as a, both a non-fiction medium and you know a, an important medium uh, to record current events as well. Um, so I know, Christy, if you wanted to talk a little bit about sort of your definition of comics, that would be great. Yes, um, I made a slide with this definition to illustrate it. Uh, the slide is a two-page sequence, wordless, and it shows a dog skeleton getting out of a grave and then running back in because they forgot their umbrella. Um, so, let's see. It's by Jason, a cartoonist, Fanographics publishes. So, uh, my short definition of comics is that it's sequential images that need to be read together to generate their full meaning. They can have words, but the words support the art. Whereas with illustration, the art supports the words. There can be comics without words, but generally there aren't comics without art. Um, I'm using the word comics. Art Spiegelman in the 60s, 70s said, spelled it with an X to say it's a co-mix of words and images. Um, a couple definitions here. 
Graphic as a modifier is used as a shorthand for comics in the book industry, a graphic memoir, a graphic nonfiction, a series of graphic novels. Uh, the book industry calls comics artists illustrator, but uh, according to the above definition, I call them the artist or the comics artist. Um, I'm going to use the word cartoonist when I talk about writer artists. Yeah, uh, and Gary, did you want to talk a little bit about sort of what comics means to you, or maybe uh, how comics, how that meaning has changed in the public over time? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I've, I've lived through, um, I mean, professionally lived through this vast change in comics as an art form and the perception of comics among the public. Um, in 1976, when I co-founded the Comics Journal, the proposition that comics could be capable of serious arti artistic expression that it could seriously tackle genres like memoir, journalism, history, or fiction was just laughable. It was laughable among the general public, uh, among academics, among the intelligentsia, among you know every group that reads, uh, because comics were perceived essentially as subliterate trash which they mostly were. <laughs> uh, and, so, and so what, I, what, what, I've, what I've watched and what I've participated in from that time is the growth of comics as a, as a bona fide art form that's capable, it's fully capable of the kind of expression that you see in film, uh, in fiction, in poetry, in every you know, aesthetic discipline. Um, I mean, I, th I think the forum has grown more in the last 40 years um, than probably any, any art form um, that I can think of, uh, you know, including, including film, which, uh, you know, even, even the early days of film, which was not, um, which was not critically lauded. I mean, film was considered a kind of vulgar art in the 1910s and 20s and 30s. Uh, but then, but you know, looking back on it, you had Chaplin and Keaton and and uh, you know uh, Harold Lloyd, and, and you you know you had people that we now see as geniuses. But um, comic books, um, you know, didn't even have that kind of pedigree behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think that actually does lead us into sort of the next uh, question, which is, uh, you know, going over to, to Christy, sort of going over how comics has changed and why. Um, and you had a lot of really interesting things to say about that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so um, I prepared a slide with just basically showing the history of... I would say maybe the easiest way to explain it is like newspaper strips, um, but I'll, I'll walk you through it uh, quickly. So this is a slide showing a man with an enormous book next to him, and it's a screen grab from a YouTube channel uh, which is cited on the slide. And that's how big comic pages used to be. Um, it's a broadsheet, and I put the dimensions on there. Uh, just to so like you'd be reading the comics page like this. Um, and comics have always been tied to advances in technology, whether it's improvements in engraving to fill up booklets made out of paper surpluses with original content, um, the accessibility of photocopiers, or the internet getting big enough to be able to upload image files. Um, kids have been reading comics since the 1800s, whether in the newspaper, at the grocery store, on the web, or on Instagram. And kids are even creating their own comics and sharing them with Google Docs uh, among their friends these days. So, and then, yeah, I just wanted to walk you through these slides. Um, got it. So. This is also part in the typos. I had just had oral surgery when I assembled this PowerPoint, so there are typos. I apologize. 
But um, so we just saw the big broadsheet sized comics from the early 1900s. This is a Peanuts comic strip from the 70s and Charles Schultz was actually disappointed when they shrank the size of the comics. <laughs> Um, this is in 1990, actually I should look at my printout, 1997, 1998, yes, they, this, they started doing web comics. Um, I'm not sure if any of you are familiar with PAX, the Penny Arcade Expo, the game convention, but these, uh, the people who founded it actually made a web comic and the convention came out of that. Um, I'm also showing, so this is from Zen Pencils, and early web comics were basically newspaper strips on the web. So as you just saw with that Charles Schultz slide, they were, you know, a row of panels right to left horizontal. But in 2010, cell phones, uh, smartphones became ubiquitous and they became long scrolls. So this is a 2015 Zen Pencil strip. And then um, this is recent. Uh, this is Dog Biscuits, which was a comic that ran in panels on Instagram during the pandemic from a local cartoonist. Um, it covered the Black Lives Matters protests, CHOP, um, the pandemic, and this is how it appeared and people were following along at that time on Instagram and Alex Graham self-published it, sold about a thousand copies and Fantagraphics just uh, put the book out this year so you can see how those panels are translated into a comics page. Yeah, I think it's really interesting the way that, um, you know, as technology changes, people are kind of emulating the prior technology because that is sort of what they've grown up with, what they've sort of learned about how comics have to be. And the, the sort of rapid change in technological methods of sharing comics um, has sort of facilitated that rapid change in comics as a medium, right? Um, just it all ties together. Um, and we're in the... Museum of History and Industry, so that sort of ties to that too. <laughs> oh, thank you. Um, yeah, so so comics have you know changed a lot, but what I think is really cool is um, you know I think what we call comics has also changed. Um, am I am I picking up all right? I think okay, <laughs> um, because uh, you know I wanted to sort of go back to the kinds of comics that have been produced in history. Uh, as first person accounts as primary source material, comics being made by people that are living through historic events. Um, and you know, one of the ones that um, Tamiko and I certainly know very well is Citizen 13660 by Mina Okubo. Um, she was a young artist in, 19, in the 1940s who um, was incarcerated because she lived in California. Um, she was incarcerated along with other Japanese Americans. And uh, she recorded her experience in a visual diary, um, which um, you know she was able to keep because she was an artist. Uh, and it was the first book published after the camps by a person who had actually been in the camps. Um, and you know, as a graphic memoir, it is you know I consider it a comic. And and the cool thing about Mine's work is that um, her her uh, text was had to be approved by the War Relocation Authority, the you know government agency that was in charge of the incarceration. So there's a lot of censorship still going on about her experiences at that time, but she was able to show more honesty in her drawings than she was able to write about in the page. And that is one of the key things, I think, that makes comics such a, a vital part of you know, primary source resources, is that there are things that um, are heavily censored and heavily you know, uh, regulated by you know, those in power. And uh, a lot of times, they do not have the visual literacy to understand what is being drawn. <laughs> 
Um, and so I thought maybe, Tomiko, you could talk more about that, about yeah. the primary source, comics as a primary source material. Yeah, about Okubo's work, okay. one of the best things I think about that book, this book, is that she is in almost every one, I believe, mm -hmm. of these illustrations, if not in every illustration. And so you're not only seeing what the experience was, you're also seeing the expressions on her face, right, as she's in these terrible conditions, um, and how her body even is being kind of contorted in certain ways to fit into the frame and thus into the whole structure of camp that was incarceration. Mm -hmm. um, so I found um, when we were writing We Hereby Refuse, our graphic novel about the incarceration, one of the books that we did turn to was Okubo's work because it was yet another source, right, for us um, to see how people were um, experiencing it and putting themselves out there on the page, quite literally, right? One of the things that I love, um, that I loved about working with this format was that there's a certain amount of intimacy that's involved. There's a certain amount of vulnerability that is involved that you don't necessarily get from a history textbook or even something that's presented to you as a primary source, right, in history classes, right? The sepia photos, the black and white photos, the, um, the legal text or whatever, right? There's something that I think comics can break down for us when we're looking at history that people think, oh, okay, it's sort of just comics, right? Um, and by doing that, we can really reach a different kind of audience and a different kind of reader in that sense. Yeah. And you can see even here, I chose some images from okay. uh, Citizen 13660. Um, you know, there are no photos that I have ever been able to find of the bathroom stalls in the oh. assembly center. Yes. Um, and so the only existing visual information that we have are, is art, and it's art that is paired with Mine's words and her experiences. Um, and again, it's, it's so powerful that she was able to record that and she probably didn't realize what an important you know, drawing this is. But um, yeah, it's just amazing. And you know, the other image I showed um, features barbed wire and, and guns being held by guards, which were things that the WRA phot photographers were not supposed to take a photo of because you know, there were these very sanitized photos released about what the camps were like. And so the artists are the ones who are able to convey the truth of what the camp's conditions were. Um, and, and as, as Tomiko said, um, Mine's expressions and the expressions that she draws shows you know, the deep sorrow and the fear and the confusion um, that photographs just have a hard time capturing, especially you know, in a group of people that is trying to seem very um, compliant and you know non-threatening <laughs> so yeah I think it's just such a valuable text I could just add really quickly Kiku um, when we wrote um, some of the scenes that are set down in Puyallup at Camp Harmony um, at the state fairgrounds um, one of the things that we were looking for were photographs of guard towers and we did eventually find them but it took us a really long time but what we had were eyewitness accounts Right, we knew from people who were there that there were guard towers. We knew that they, but we didn't know exactly where they were stationed, how tall were they, what did they look like, and so then we remembered, wait, there were artists there at Camp Harmony, and so we were able to start looking and doing our research by finding what the artists had to record, and we drew from those in part. Yeah, Eddie Sato is one of those artists who um, illustrated sort of a entry guides for new arrivals to the camp. And um, a lot of that was really purely in, you know, it was just for information's sake, but uh, for new arrivals, but now it's this important historical document. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Tomko, if you want to uh, continue talking about sort of your research process, uh, talking about, you know, how you research for a historical uh, graphic narrative. Was, was this published as a book? Yes. Yeah, this is actually, Mine's book is uh, published through UW Press yeah. now, so um, you can definitely uh, pick it up. <laughs> <clears throat> All right. Um, 
So I just wanted to give folks a little bit of an overview of our graphic novel for people who might not be familiar. Um, it was written by myself and a local journalist and historian, Frank Abe. Uh, there's a picture of the creative team up here. So on this slide, actually, there's um, on the left, there's the cover for We, he we Hereby Refuse. It's a telephone pole with a poster and the title. And there's a Japanese-American man standing in front of a shoe repair shop in Seattle's Japantown slash International District. Um, on the right, there's a color photo of four people, the creative team from left to right, uh, me and Matt Sasaki, Frank Abe, and Ross Ishikawa. They were all, we were all Japanese-Americans. We all had family who were incarcerated. There were two writers and two artists. And it was a graphic novel because The Wing is publishing a series of graphic novels about the incarceration. The first one was about second generation Nisei veterans called Fighting for America. The second one is called We Hereby Refuse, that's ours, about those who resisted the incarceration. And the third one, which Kiku illustrated, is called Those Who Helped. Um, about allies who helped us during the incarceration time period. On the bottom right, there's a black and white picture of barracks and a mountain and clouds. And that is a picture that I used to ground me. That's part of my family history. My family was incarcerated at Tule Lake, which is where that bottom right picture is. So the graphic novel then is focused on, oops, let's see. Go back. Oh, I think I'm missing a slide, but oh, that's no. okay. Sorry. That's all right. Um, I'll just uh, go back to the cover. The, the slide has, um, there are three main characters. We call them characters, but they're real people. Um, there are three main storylines focused on three second generation Japanese Americans. Uh, one of them is Jim Akutsu from Seattle. He was rejected from volunteering for military service and then resisted the draft from Minidoka in Idaho in a concentration camp. And he insisted on having his citizenship rights restored. Um, the second person is Hiroshi Kashiwagi from Penryn, California. And he refused to sign a government loyalty questionnaire. And then under pressure, he renounced his American citizenship and it was restored later. He was my uncle. And third, we have Mitsuye Endo, who is a typist working for the state of California. And while she was imprisoned, she refused the government offer of a plea bargain and then remained behind barbed wire for another 18 months. She and her attorney, James Purcell, took her case all the way to the Supreme Court, and she won unanimously. But her name is not very well known, so we really wanted to bring her case and her name to light. Um, taken together, these three characters show us very different portraits of what it means to resist and the complex decisions behind doing so. So I've said that the three are human beings making human decisions. We tend to hear, you know, lionize people who resist or make them heroes that we can't touch or talk about but we wanted to really bring the humanity of these people to the fore. Um, so a bit about Endo, and I wanted to talk about the research pro um, process because before writing this graphic novel, I had no idea what it was to actually take <laughs> a graphic novel um, and to write it. I'm a words girl, I'm still a words girl, and so I didn't know what the process was for writing a graphic novel. And so we did a lot of research. It took us about four years, honestly, to write this book, um, longer than any of us anticipated. Um, so I'm gonna take you on a deep dive, sort of researchy, um, Pan to, to show you a little bit of what it was to take one moment in history and take it all the way through to a panel, um, or a, a few panels and pages. So Mitsuya Endo, as I said here, um, that's her. Um, on the, on the uh, right of the slide is a young Japanese American woman sitting at a typewriter, black and white photo. The caption that I have here is from research to scene. 
Um, she was part of a collective action suit with Nisei California State employees, and her lawyer found her through this lawsuit. They were all fired for being Japanese, essentially, after Pearl Harbor, because they were being suspected as disloyal to the United States. And her case then was a habeas corpus case, meaning can you detain United States citizens indefinitely? And I really appreciated Endo's willingness to stay in camp while her case was heard, but especially her refusal of the government's plea bargain. And since she won unanimously at the Supreme Court, that actually led to the closing of the camps. So as far as what was out there about her, she was painfully shy. She gave perhaps two short interviews that we knew of. She'd had a bad experience with a reporter after she was released from camp. So we had to do a lot of digging. On the slide here, there's some cut out text from an academic journal, and it says secondary source, academic journal article. I got to dive into her personal story first through the Densho Encyclopedia, and the bibliography for the entry led me to this journal and an article. And now we knew that Endo had won, but we didn't know how she reacted to the news. So there was a footnote in the journal that, said, that had an excerpt of the letter from Endo's best friend at the time, and that told us what we needed to know. She came running in with the telegram, and they were so happy that they danced around the room. And that was just a lovely moment for us to find, and we knew that we had to take that into the book. From there, um, I also found in the California State Archives um, a whole sheaf of letters between Endo and her lawyer, Jim Purcell. Um, and when the PDF scan came through on my computer, I realized that this was really maybe the second time that I got to hear, quote, hear Endo's voice. Um, so I had requested these archives, and here's the telegram that she sent um, her lawyer upon learning the news that she had won. I'm extremely joyous of results. Appreciate very much your long effort in restoring our rights. I have to ask, did the yeah. telegraph person misspell her name? I'm or? sure. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, from there, we uh, then went to story arcs for each character. Um, and that's what this slide says. It basically says story arc for Mitsuya Endo, and there's a paragraph description. So we began to write character descriptions, story arcs, what was she like, what was her family like. Um, we, uh, you know, I did some of the archival research. My co-author, Frank, actually flew out to the Midwest and met her uh, son and um, her daughter. Um, we, get to, we got to read more of her voice in the archives. And then we tried to figure out where to put these moments into the action. From there, we went to the impaneled script, which then kind of just tries to break down the story arc into scenes and then how many pages and panels and panels per page. Um, and where is the action taking place? What might she have said? Um, we had suggestions to the artists about where to put them into panels, what information might be in each one. And from there, we went to another impaneled script. This went through actually many versions. Um, but we had thumbnail photos for the artists. We had to caption them. Uh, we had to give stage directions. What would she be like? She was running, right? So was she out of breath, for example? Um, what were the Topaz barracks like? What did the Topaz post office look like when she would have gotten the news? And from there, the artists went to work. This is Rossi Shikawa's work. And so there's a black and white ink drawing on the left, a young woman getting a telegram. On the right, there's a full color comic book page with dialogue bubbles. Um, Ross did the sketches. And on the left, you see that he has some panels without dialogue. And he wanted to give that moment some space. And then we had to compress it a bit as the script went on and the drafts went on. And there. Uh, another pen and ink drawing on the left, full color comic book panel on the right, two Japanese American women reacting to good news on the telegram. 
Um, so we worked on this for some time. What would the barracks have been furnished by then? What would they look like? What kind of coats would they have been wearing? What would a telegraph office have looked like or a telegraph machine? Um, so every scene in this book has this level approximately of historical research checked by us, but also checked by historians and experts. And I think, you know, it's so great to see, you know, the final panel of her dancing around the yes. room and how much life it gives this story. And when you compare it to, you know, that one little sentence about it, you know, it really is a, 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 a way to tell history that brings, breathes life into these actions so uh, effectively. And I think that's a really great example of it, you know, you can see the joy and you can feel it because you can see it, yeah, or you can experience it. Um, yeah, so thank you, that's awesome. And I, I think it's great for people to see the process of making a graphic novel, um, that it, you know, it takes so many different steps and, um, and, you know, when you finally get the finished product, it's hard to imagine that you started with just a little sketch. <laughs> um, but that does bring me to, uh, you know, comics as a history telling medium. You know, what gives comics uh, a unique, uh, what is unique about telling these stories as comics? What does this medium bring to, you know, historical telling? You know, history is always uh, subjective and it's always a process of selecting which parts of information are important um, and in comics doubly so because you have all the visual information um, so yeah maybe uh, if Christy you want to talk about you know how people have told historical stories in comics yeah um, okay well let's PowerPoint mm -hmm. um, this is a slide Comics tell a story, a history of their own. They are also, in and of themselves, a historical document. Um, I just wanted to talk about how Hilda Gadea, Gadea Ernesto Che Guevara's first wife, um, has been depicted in three different graphic biographies of Che. Um, that'd be awesome. Thank you. Okay. So in this first slide, um, it's a panel, just one panel. Um, che is in the foreground. He's lounging. It's black and white and chiaroscuro. Um, actually, I'll just be. All right. Um, yeah, thanks. And so this is, okay, so this is the way that Alberto Breccia and Hector German Osterheld depicted this scene in their 1969 graphic biography of Che. They're Argentine people um, and all three of these graphic biographies, I'm going to preface, they're really engaging with the iconography, iconography and the symbolism and the ideology first, I would say, of Che Guevara. Um, and so this is subtitled an impressionistic biography. It was rushed out just a year after he died. Um, the creators were both born in 1919. And actually, Breccia's son, Enrique, also drew half of this comic. Um, so they're about 50-ish when this came out. And it was so rushed, they couldn't even get Che's birth certificate in on time. And so there was just a blank panel. And then when they published it in France in the 90s, everybody thought this was like a very symbolic thing. And they wrote many, many papers about it. But it was just they didn't get the birth certificate in in time. That's an aside. Um, but the military government destroyed the means to reprint this book. And um, this put the writer Osterheld on their radar, uh, their radar. He later joined a guerrilla group, and he was disappeared by the government um, along with his daughters and their husbands. Um, so this is all context for this book, and this this graphic biography doesn't really make sense unless you include all of that. 
But the reason I wanted to choose this panel is because Hilda, again, she's Che's first wife. Uh, they had a daughter. And it's, this is 1969, published in Argentina, you know, by two Argentine artists and uh, a Uruguayan artist, an Argentine artist, and an Argentine writer. And this is the only panel she shows up in. Um, she's only mentioned, her name is only mentioned four times. And she's basically kind of depicted as like a groovy chick. Um, it's 1969. She like doesn't really give Che a hard time. She kind of like, you know, helps him out. He's a student. Um, he's, you know, they're both in Guatemala. So in the next slide, this is from Spain Rodriguez's 2008 graphic biography. Um, Spain Rodriguez is a countercultural Marxist cartoonist uh, starting in the 60s and 70s. Um, it's a very earnest portrayal of this woman um, who was a Peruvian economist and a Marxist who was exiled to Guatemala in the late 1940s. There she met Che in the early 1950s. Um, essentially, she taught him how to be an activist, uh, informed his political ideology, and helped him make political connections so he could go on to be Che. Um, she also wrote a book about it called My Life with Che. And you can just see how Spain depicts her. She is you know, she's got this halo around her. She's an exciting woman. She's a person. She's getting things done. She is clearly a role model and a, you know, an important political figure in her own right. And then my third slide. Um, this is told from the, this is going to be a mouthful. 2018 edition of the 2016 Spanish graphic adaptation of the 1997 best-selling Che biography by John Lee Anderson. And it's supposed to be warts and all. Um, it's very brown. It's very brown. <laughs> um, Che's got like a pointy finger and he's just kind of yelling at her. Um, it's, it's told from Che's point of view, and so she barely speaks, and she kind of comes across as like dumpy and lovelorn. Um, yeah, so I just was hoping to illustrate basically three, and contextualize three Che graphic biographies and show how the same person is viewed in three different contexts. Yeah, and I think you know what it really shows is how you know subjective that history is in a way that I think is a lot more obvious sometimes than in just prose. Um, you know, with prose, I think it can be easy to kind of uh, ignore or skate by the biases that people are putting into history. But I think, in, especially in these panels that you've selected, it's very clear to see visually how how they viewed her, you know, and, and what sort of framework they were putting her character in. Um, and I, yeah, I find that really interesting um, to see those three together. Uh, and then, so Gary, you also had a few, like, selections about different comics that uh, have told history in different ways. Um, if you want to talk through just a couple of those, yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah I just selected um, a handful of, of, um, of comics and graphic novels to demonstrate how history has been told um, starting in 1951. This is a comic called Two Fisted Tales that was created by Harvey Kurtzman. Kurtzman created Mad when it was a comic book, not a magazine. But before he created Mad, he was editing comic books for EC, and two of the comics he edited were Two-Fisted Tales and Frontline Combat, which were basically war comics. And as you might imagine, most, comic, most war comic books at that time were xenophobic, propagandistic, rah-rah, America, 
comics that depicted American soldiers as uh, valorous and the enemy as uh, you know, stereotyped villains. Kurtzman wanted to, depicted, wanted to depict war with greater complexity and greater humanity and his comics are often considered anti-war comics uh, in the sense that they did not glorify war. And he was a scrupulous editor, probably one of the best editors in the history of comics. He wrote and drew, he wrote all of the stories in his two, his two bi-monthly comics and drew some of them and he also, and he had a, um, uh, three or four different artists who were some of the best artists in comics who um, drew the scripts that he wrote. This one is drawn by uh, a brilliant cartoonist named Wallace Wood. So he's known for his realism in depicting war and, and his realism in depicting the, um, the enemy as actually human, which was uh, shocking uh, for that period in comic book history. Do you mind if I ask a follow-up question? Oh, absolutely. Uh, so uh, I know early on in comics there were uh, there was an effort, like in a lot of artistic mediums, of censorship. There was the code, uh, the code that was you know to enforce sort of what was allowed to be published as which, a comic. Which came in after this. Yeah. Oh, I was yeah. So I was wondering. So can, maybe do you know? Could you talk a little bit about that censorship? <clears throat> oh, I could talk about that for hours. <laughs> um, yeah, in, in 1950, I think it was 1950. Uh, the United States uh, um, Senate Subcommittee um, on Juvenile Delinquency held um, committee hearings, the purpose of which was to establish that comic books uh, created and nurtured juvenile delinquency. And this was uh, moderated by a senator by the name of Estes Kavaver, who was, who was wanting to run for president and he thought this would be a good platform. <laughs> And, uh, and so comics were, you know, essentially demonized as, as literally um, fostering juvenile delinquency. And this was a, a great post-war concern. Um, it's, you know, it's when, it's when the youth market started coming up. I forget what year uh, Rebel Without a Cause was, but probably about 55. <laughs> that sort of encapsulates, you know, the, the fears of, of, of youth and what was happening to, uh, to, to young people at that time. And comic books were um, considered uh, a major source. There were, there were literally public comic book burnings. There are photos you can find in old newspapers from, from the early 50s, uh, and even earlier than that, where people were throwing comics on bonfires outside. Um, so this was, this, was, this was a huge deal, and, and what happened was that after these comic book hearings, in which publishers and artists testified in front of the subcommittee, as well as um, psychiatrists and, and teachers and public servants, uh, the comic book industry, um, under threat of government censorship, decided to create their own internal censorship called the Comics Code Authority, to which all of the comic pub book publishers belonged and contributed money um, and then this board censored comic books and assured all of the retailers who sold comics and all of the parents uh, whose kids were reading comics, the comics were now going to be wholesome. <laughs> and they weren't going to contain images like this. Yeah. <laughs> um, and for the most part, that's what happened. Um, horror comics died, a lot of comic publishers died, the industry was reduced by roughly half between 1954 and 1960. A lot of publishers went out of business. Um, and comics became um, kind of anodyne and even more banal than they were. Mm -hmm. Which probably led to this impression that has still been had by a lot of people up until very recently that comics are kind of fluffy and not serious literature and, and people don't realize sort of the government's role in, in fulfilling that prophecy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, sorry, go on. Oh, no. <laughs> um, um, okay. Next slide. Maybe we can have, skip oh, to I have a slide. Yeah. <laughs> Look, tell me tell me where you'd like me to Maybe skip. Maybe we can skip to mouse. I think that's yeah. one that people will have heard of and, and yes. know about. Uh, Art Spiegelman's Mouse, which uh, you probably do know, is his memoir, 
uh, about his father, um, who was in a um, concentration camp. Um, and uh, Spiegelman started working on this in, in 1980. In fact, he started working on this earlier than that um, by doing a short strip for um, Underground Comics that eventually became part of Mao's later. Uh, he did that in the um, uh, 70s, as long ago as the 70s. And then he started, create, he started actually fashioning this, this graphic novel narrative in 1980. It was serialized in his own, um, um, his and Francois Mouly's avant-garde comics magazine starting in 1980. Uh, the magazine was called Raw. And, you know, Mao's was important because it was published as a graphic novel in, I think, in 1987. And it was really the first graphic novel to be truly recognized as something that um, could be produced in comics um, that could be considered valid as literature and as memoir and as history. I remember um, reading, much to my consternation, a review in The New Yorker that said something. I mean, it was so unheard of for comic books to be considered even, even, even remotely possible as literature that the reviewer in The New Yorker said that this, is, this, this can't be comics because it's just too good. <laughs> Um, and of course, it was the kind of comics that people like myself always thought, you know, could and should exist. Um, and and this, this was a, um, you know, the, Art interviewed his father, uh, who was a survivor, and, uh, and based on that interview, he, he fashioned Mao's. And it's a story about his father in the concentration camp and his relationship with his father afterward, which, um, which was very rocky. Um, so it's both a personal and kind of intimate story about Art and his father, and of course his, father, um, his father's vivid recollections of the concentration camp. Mm -hmm. uh, the interesting thing about Mouse, I always thought, was you know, it's not only a comic, which is already kind of unheard of as a, at the time, unheard of as a historical text, um, like but he's the, also... The metaphorical... Uh, yeah, the he's, mice and the, and the, and the, yeah. He's, he's depicted the characters as uh, anthropomorphized mice and cats. Um, and I, I do wonder, you know, it's amazing that he broke through those barriers that of, uh, you know, people were actually able to take, you know, to suspend their disbelief in a certain way. Um, right, yeah. right. Um, and, and, and I mean, that was, I mean, our arts are very um, deliberate mm -hmm. and very thoughtful cartoonist, and, and that was a very calculated choice. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of if I can remember why he said he did that. Um, I mean, I think he wanted, he, you know, he wanted it to be a kind of, he, he didn't want individual um, distinctive human faces so that you could project your own um, humanity onto the characters. Mm -hmm. You wanted something um, one step removed from depicting, you know, human human characters. Yeah. Um, he, you know, he's been criticized for that because, you know, there's, there's a kind of, I don't know, reductive aspect to it. But I think, you know, I think it holds up. Yeah. And, and again, it's something that I think is uniquely possible in this you know, history telling method. You, know, you can't really uh, get across that same sort of symbolism and that same, you know, visual iconography in a, in a novel saying, you know, these are all mice. <laughs> Ab absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I mean one, of, one of the things about, um, you know, about, about comics and, um, and specifically about rendering history in comics is that there's no such thing as an objective drawing. Mm -hmm. I mean, all drawings are interpretive. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so, there, I mean, I, I think you can make an analogy between a prose writing historian, because, of course, prose writers who write history also use adjectives, and those are subjectively determined. Mm -hmm. um, but in comics, uh, you know, the artist is, is interpreting history graphically in, in the way he can through his own stylistic mannerisms. Um, and and in, in some way coloring that, that history. Exactly. I, I thought about that a lot um, when I was making my own comic that is a history comic, but 
there are you know, mm. elements of it that I knew I wouldn't have the you know, historical facts about. Um, and I, I appreciated comics as a way of telling a story that has an incomplete historical record because it really in, tells the reader immediately, you know, we're filling in the gaps here somewhat because, you know, as you said, art is you know, entirely interpretive. So, um, yeah, I appreciate that. It, it's, a, it's an immediate indicator to the reader that, you know, the details and the specific historical fact um, are less important than the story that I'm telling you. You know, I think it also indicates that there's no one history. You know, yes. that, 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 that history is to some extent always interpretive. Absolutely. You know, and, that, and, that, and, that, and, the gra and the different graphic stylizations just underscores that. Yeah, and that actually brings me back to camps. Sorry, I talk about that a lot. It's what I've done the most research on. Actually, but I, I very quickly sidebar. Yes, please. Are, is the audience aware of school boards trying to remove mouse <laughs> out of the curriculum yes. currently? OK, I was just checking just to see if <laughs> We were up on that particular current event. Um, please continue. Yeah, and that I, I, that I talked to Art when he was in the middle of that, and I congratulated him for his inc incredible PR move. <laughs> <laughs> Mouse sold out throughout the country. Yeah, yeah. 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 but it does. It harkens back to the the code, the creation of the code. Oh yeah. Code. Oh yeah. There's, all, I mean, there's, there's always that, and and that's happening more and more. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Um, but yes. Uh, so there is a. a Another primary source historical document that I found recently um, that is an issue of Superman where he visits the incarceration camps. Um, he visits, I don't know if it was a real camp, I think they made it up, but he goes there as Clark Kent, as his journalist persona, to write a story about the camps. What? And it is an incredible historical document. What, it was, what year? I think it was 43. I think so in the middle. In the middle, what? and it was it depicts him finding the spy ring of Japanese spies that are trying to destroy the American government, oh. and he fights them as Superman. <laughs> and this, the amazing thing about this comic is, it not only tells you so much about what um, you know white Americans were reading at the time about what the camps were, and and it, it's a real government project about you know even to the kids, it's like. There are spies in those camps. Um, but it also was read heavily by Japanese American kids in the camps who loved Superman. Aww. And um, yeah, the role of comics in sort of building a national narrative is fascinating to me, especially when you have a character like Superman who is held up as this all American guy. Yeah. Was this in the regular monthly Superman comic books? Yeah, it was. Well, it was a strip, I think, yeah. in a. a well, I, I, I'm not sure I knew that. Yeah. Yeah, it's an amazing document. Highly recommend looking that up. <laughs> is it grotesque? Uh, I mean, is it, it, it has a little bit of caricature. Um, yeah, definitely, and a little bit of uh, you know the broken English spoken yeah. and things like that. Um, so yeah, it, it uses the same caricatures that you can see in a lot of cartoons of what Japanese people look like um, during World War II. Um, but then it also in inserts this other dimension of you know this all-American hero is fighting these you know very foreign looking almost inhuman looking in the way that people were drawn um, people and that was sort of how kids around the country were getting information about these camps um, so yeah yeah the caricatures during world war ii and during the korean war were just oh. you know horrifying yeah uh, dr seuss <laughs> yeah yeah right <laughs> Um, yeah, so if you want to go on, maybe choose um, a, another one. I go one. to, what would you, I mean, I'm going to uh, Whichever one you prefer. Lead. Oh, okay. Um, let's, uh, let's go to the, uh, let's, let's do this one. The art style is very unique. Yeah, I, re I mean, I read this not, so this came out, this is uh, a self-published uh, comic. It's about... Let's see, I read it maybe last year. Um, I think it's still published. It came out about two years ago, I think. It's a, it's a, it's a depiction of the, the Puerto Rican War um, by uh, John Vasquez. I'm going I'm to mangle his last name. Mahias. Mahias. And uh, I don't know. I don't know anything about him. Um, I think, as I said, I think it's self-published. And it's about, um, 
boy, I would say it's about 48 or 56 pages long. It's done in, it's either done in woodcut, which is amazing today because, you know, many artists do not do woodcut anymore. It was something that was, that was done more often in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, uh, or, or, it's, or it's an extremely um, good uh, facsimile of a, of a woodcut, and I don't really know which. Um, but anyway, it's, 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 it's a remarkable um, and, and unflinching depiction uh, of the Puerto Rican War, presumably by someone who feels you know, strongly about it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and, and the artist obviously put a tremendous amount of work, um, effort, uh, historical research into it. Um, and this is a great example of, of a cartoonist doing a lot, of, you know, a lot of work for what, what is obviously little financial reward. <laughs> because I believe he self-published this. It probably didn't sell more than mm -hmm. 1,000 copies or 1,500 copies, mm -hmm. something like that. But it is, you know, it, it, it impressed me mm -hmm. um, as being a, a, an astonishing um, recent piece of historiography. Yeah, and it, you know, all these graphic depictions of war, it, it reminds me of, um, you know, when television and photographs were first introduced and people were able to see war firsthand for the first time. And I do think sort of these visual depictions of violence changes so much of how you absorb this story. Um, you well, know, it, Vietnam being the TV war. Right, first exactly. War, yeah. And the yeah. Crimean War, um, yeah. the first one, <laughs> anyway. Uh, you know, having the first photographs of what it was like uh, on the front lines, you know, it changes everything about how you view a conflict if you can see that. And I think, um, you know, comics in a, in a certain way have always been that as well. But again, they have that removed, you, you know, artistic liberty element of it. So, but yeah, I think it's, it's interesting how many comics are explicitly about violence. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of that is because of the power of that sort of art and uh, allowing you to sort of feel that violence firsthand. Um, yeah. You mean historic comics or comics in general? I mean, comics in general <laughs> are a lot of violence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, I think yeah. it's because the medium, it lends itself to that action and that feeling of immersion, yeah. Well, you know, if I could, uh, I, I, if I could mention Joe Sacco's work, I mean, oh, yeah. Joe is sort of the gold standard of um, journalistic comics, and, and, and as we all know, journalism becomes history. I forget who said that journalism was the first draft of history. <laughs> um, but Joe, um, in a way, really pioneered journalistic comics in the 1990s when he did his first um, such book called Palestine which he did in a comic book format over about 10 or 11 issues, I think, and then we collected it into a graphic novel. And, um, and then after that, he did a book called Safe Area Garajda, uh, which was about the Croatian war. And Joe um, actually goes to a war zone with a flak jacket and stays there for weeks um, or months and takes notes, um, does drawings, does sketches, and interviews people, and then comes back with all of this information and spends two to three to four <laughs> years drawing a graphic novel um, about it, graphic journalism. And, um, and, 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 and I think one of the most important things about Joe's work, I mean, I, I, think, I think he's a brilliant journalist and a brilliant writer, but without his particular drawing, which is, um, it's amazingly detailed, it's, it's brilliantly drafted, it's intimate, it's personal. He draws, um, I mean, you know, contrary to Spiegelman, but he draws um, every face depicted in there is individualized. Mm -hmm. um, and he, you know, he's, he so humanizes uh, the characters in these war zones. Um, that it, it just brings forth the uh, the humanity, or, you know, or, or the inhumanity. I, I once asked him, you were talking about violence, and and Joe will draw these, I mean, truly, truly horrific mm -hmm. tableaus of, um, of of dead and dying people, and I asked him if that actually took a toll on him because it, it, it's so intense, 
And uh, he said it did. Mm -hmm. He said, he, in fact, you know, like you know, after he finishes a graphic novel, with, with that level of intensity, um, he has to he has to do something else. He can't yeah. he can't he can't go and, and do something like that right away because it just took some so much out of him. Yeah. To actually depict to sit over the drawing board for hours on end and depict dead people. Yeah. It it is a it's sort of a meditation in that way. You know. I mean. Of, of what it means that this happened and that he experienced it. Yeah, yeah that's very interesting. Um, so we only have about, uh, I think we're supposed to pivot to questions now from the audience. Um, okay. Um, for Tomiko, uh, can you talk about the difference in research and depiction of characters known mostly through public resources and the research and depiction of your own uncle's experiences and your relationship to that? Ooh, okay, can I see it actually? Yes. I'm better at reading than I am listening for things. Um, yeah. So one of the things about my uncle is that um, he was one of the very few um, Nisei, and one of the first Nisei to talk publicly about his experience. So he started talking about it as early as the, I believe, 1960s, 1970s, um, when most of the community was not talking about it at all. So, um, but you know, he was my uncle, right? <laughs> and so I knew him as this sort of, you know, kind of quiet, shy uh, figure at family gatherings. And only when I was in college did I really realize what he was, what he had done, what he had written. So I had this sort of knowledge of him as, you know, a private persona. Um, and then I had a knowledge of him as a public persona later when I got to read his writing, when I got to see him perform, when I did interviews, um, when I saw interviews with him, read interviews with him. Um, so I reckon how we brought that into the graphic novel was I knew that there was the persona that was fiery and angry, um, and there was the persona that um, was the librarian, the quieter um, figure. And so we tried to put both of those in. There's a scene in the graphic novel where um, there's a dance that they go to, and I knew that he hated dancing. <laughs> um, so, but we had, so we had to kind of put that in as, well, you know, I didn't like to dance that much, but you know, this person taught me how. So I think really, you know, actors and writers right, can have that in common, right? They have that sort of introverted side, and they have the extroverted side. Um, so I think reconciling the two was a challenge. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> awesome. Um, so maybe for Christy, how has technology changed the actual drawing process? Like we've seen how it changes how people consume comics, but how has it changed how people make comics, do you think? Mm. Mm. You'd actually probably be better to answer that since you're an artist. <laughs> <laughs> um, but a lot of it has to do with people are now using Procreate, they're using tablets. Um, you can draw a blue line on your computer and then you can print that out, ink it. Um, there's a lot going on. I mean, Photoshop is a tool that people are using. That's a passive sense construction because most people don't use it well. <laughs> but um, it, it, is, it is very interesting. And like I said, I'm, I'm actually really more interested again, in how people are sharing and creating comics. And I'm also very interested in uh, the archival aspect because, for example, a webcomic you drew in 1999 has to be very, very low resolution. It can't really be reproduced in print, and if it disappears on a hard drive, it's gone forever. So that's more of what I focus on, but I think you would probably actually be better able to talk about how people draw and create comics. I think, I mean, that's a great answer. And one of the things I was going to sort of think about, I mean, the digital drawing tools are very helpful, um, especially, uh, you know, very portable and very easy to use. Um, but more interesting to me also than that is uh, the way that artists, you know, get an audience in a modern age. Mm -hmm. um, 
and sort of the way that you know social media and and the availability of web comics and even things like Kickstarter have allowed a lot more audiences or have brought more audiences to comics. I think um, in recent years and, and a lot more self-published. Uh, comics because there's much lower barrier of entry when you can just publish your comic online than if you have to print it out and distribute it yourself. Um, so I honestly think the, the prevalence of web comics um, has been a huge part of making comics into a more mainstream medium um, because it's just so much more accessible and you're getting a lot of stories that don't have to be um, you know, uh, approved by an editor or picked up by a publisher, um, which, you know, like most institutions that have been around as long as publishing has, it's still, you know, hugely a white, straight industry. <laughs> but um, what with web comics and with the ability of people to self-publish for almost no cost, um, it's gotten so, like, uh, the diversity of stories is so rich. Um, with, the, with the internet. So I think that's been a huge boon. Um, yeah. Um, here's a question maybe anyone who wants to answer. Uh, Gary, you haven't talked yet, so maybe this will be for you. Um, what place do you think comics play in education and academia? Mm. I can start, but. Go ahead. Oh, yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I can say that because our graphic novel has been taught and picked up by so many places, universities, classes, colleges, um, the, the wing has developed teacher trainings around, um, around the graphic novel. And um, I hear the most from teachers, I think, who want class sets, who want to bring this to their students. Again, as another form of not just a straight history textbook. I have seen my, my kids' history textbooks, and I'm sorry, but they're dismal. They're dismal at bringing this, <laughs> at bringing this to light, and this particular uh, branch of Japanese American history and American history. So I think, really, I think comics have a huge potential um, when done right for educational purposes. Yeah, a, a lot of our books are used in academic classes. Mm -hmm. A lot of Joe Sacco's books are taught. Um, Palestine and Garage to, um, yeah, you know, more and more. I think what it, what's valuable about teaching comics in at any grade level and even you know in colleges and even beyond um, is it, it's it's exercising a different learning process um, mm -hmm. that is nonetheless extremely valuable um, and I always like to say that you know visual literacy is something that with the internet age yeah. is becoming more and more important because a lot of people are getting their information from these you know, very visual, visual heavy sources, TikTok and Instagram and things. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think it's vital for everyone to, you know, exercise a certain amount of analysis of the imagery that they're seeing. And I think that's a really good thing that co teaching comics in the classroom can, can help foster um, is that, you know, when you are analyzing an image, that image is telling you information. Um, and you know, you may not be consciously aware of all the information that it is broadcasting, but it is nonetheless doing that. And, and you know, the more that you can analyze that image, you know, the more you'll be able to navigate this world. <laughs> um, let me see. In what works, uh, in longer works like graphic novels, what do you think is more prevalent? A writer working with an artist, or an artist working with a writer, or the artist and writer working together? Maybe Gary, if you know. Yeah, that's not me. Oh. <laughs> well, um, so many, I mean, okay. So many <laughs> of the books we publish, the artist and the writer are the same person. Mm -hmm. And. I, I have to say that I think the best cartooning comes out of one person writing and drawing the comic. Um, which is not to say we haven't published, we, we're publishing a book right now, um, it's a biography of Angela Davis called Ms. Davis and there's a separate writer and a separate artist. Um, so that can be done, I mean the writer, I mean the if you don't have one person doing both of them, then the best situation is for, is for an artist and a writer to collaborate as closely as possible. Mm -hmm. And in, in, in a way to become one creative unit. Um, 
you know, that has happened in the history of comics where there is this, this symbiosis between the writer and the artist where they're, where they're just both on the same page and, they're, and, they, and they both understand each other well enough. Um, you know, if they don't, it can just be kind of disastrous because you can, you can, you can feel where there is, where the text is separate from the art um, and, and the text and, 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 and the art should ideally become one. Um, may, I, may I make a quick note? Please, yeah. Um, about your book. Um, I want to, okay, so I want to preface this that I work for the Comics Journal, which is known for applying a critical critique to comics, uh, aesthetic value judgments. But one thing I thought that was really cool about your book is the art I've got better as it went along in the sense as on a, in a long form work, you can literally see people settle into it, uh, like redrawing people over and over. Um, it just gets better, it gets more expressive, um, and your probably your collaboration became more shorthand and more comfortable. So it was really cool to just sort of see the book as it goes settle into itself. Mm, thank you. Yes. Let's tell the artist. Yes, it was. It was really. It was really. It's, it's kind of fun. You're always. I mean, you know, it's a serious topic, and you're. But you're also like, wow. Like you could just see. You could just see the progression in the art as it goes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And Chrissy, here's one for you as well. Um, somebody asked. So when did the form begin? Um, uh, this person has seen and used in teaching cartoons during the American Revolution era. Um, so I guess I think the. The question is, wh where's the difference between sort of a political cartoon and like a comic? Mm. Yeah. Most people do the Bayou Tapestry. Yes. That's kind of our, that's our meme, I guess. <laughs> that's the meme beginning of comics. Um, there's also Rodolphe Topfer, who was a Swiss cartoonist in the 1800s, who just did like image caption. Um, but I think, I mean, Gary, again, is the, he's the, you know, comics publisher. I mean, I think it just has to do with the way comics and images work together, doing things they can't do by themselves. Um, you know, 80% of the storytelling is through the art, but, you know, and also just the sequencing of it. But I think it is the way images combine to become larger than themselves in sequence or next to each other. Yeah, and I, I also think some of those early political cartoons, you know, there's so much text in them, <laughs> and you can tell um, that the, the cartoon aspect of it is really there to, in, like, generate an initial gut response that the text then reinforces um, because of, you know, the, the caricature and the, the symbolism used, you know, giant landlords, oops, sorry, <laughs> giant landlords and, um, you know, little tiny people that are under them, things like that. It's really meant to sort of give you, in my, I, in sort of in my opinion, um, that initial response that then you reinforce with the text, which I think makes it a separate thing than a, a comic, which, you know, the story is in the, the drawing. Yeah. And, and the text can work against the image also, which is a very important thing, you know, you can do in comics. You can ironically caption something, and that's a big part of political satire and humor. Um, so that's, again, a juxtaposition of meaning with sequential images and words. I just wanted to add a little bit. Um, I'm definitely not the expert, but one of the things that I learned um, from Scott McCloud's book, Understanding Comics, which I recommend for people who might want to know more about sort of the mechanics of how these work, what I loved about this book was he talked about the gutter, right? The space between panels, mm -hmm. right? As really, really important. And that was something that was, that made a comic, right? It's that viewer participation making a link between the panels, right? And that is partly what makes it a comic, maybe, as opposed to a political cartoon. And this, that sequential nature. Yeah. But as the Bayou Tapestry example shows, you know, there has been sequential art, you know, mm -hmm. throughout history, possibly older even than written words so you know it's always been you know de the definition of comic I think is mm -hmm. has very flexible <laughs>